The Nutcracker. It was Christmas time. Murray was very happy. Mr. Drosselmeyer, Marie's godfather, came to her house. He gave her a gift. It was a Nutcracker doll. The doll was very ugly. It had a big mouth. The mouth cracked nuts. Why is he so ugly, Mr. Drosselmeyer? Asked Marie. I will tell you," said her godfather. Then he told her a story. There was a baby princess. Her name was Pearly Pat. She was very pretty. Pearly Pat's father had an enemy. It was the Mouse Queen. Pearly Pat's father killed her seven sons. Why? They stole his food. So the Mouse Queen did something bad. She made Pearly Pat very ugly. She turned the princess into a Nutcracker doll. The king was sad. He asked the toy maker for help. The toy maker's name was Mr. Drosselmeyer. The toy maker knew what to do. The princess must eat a special nut, he said. What nut? The king asked. The Krakatuk nut, said the toy maker. It is a very hard nut. A boy must crack this nut. He will use his strong teeth. He will save the princess. Then he can marry her," said the king. For fifteen years, Mr. Drosselmeyer looked for the Krakatuk nut. He looked here and there. He looked near and far. He traveled the world, but he did not find it. At home, Mr. Drosselmeyer met his cousin. Mr. Drosselmeyer said, "I am looking for the Krakatuk nut." "Oh," said his cousin, "I have it." Mr. Drosselmeyer's cousin said, "Here is the nut. I bought it from a nut seller when I was a boy. Do you need it? Take it." "I need to find a boy too." Said Mr. Drosselmeyer, "He must have very strong teeth." Take my son," said the cousin. "He will help you." They went to see the king. The boy cracked the nut. He used his strong teeth. Pearlipat ate it. She was pretty again. The Mouse Queen ran to the boy. He jumped. The boy fell on the Mouse Queen and hurt her. The Mouse Queen used her magic. She turned the boy into a Nutcracker doll. Then she cried, "My last son will kill you, boy. He is the new Mouse King." After that. She died. Pearlipat looked at the Nutcracker. It was very ugly. I don't want to marry him," said Pearlipat. "You two must go away," said the King to Mr. Drosselmeyer and the Nutcracker. "Don't come back." Marie was sad. This is not a good story," she said. "Princess Pearlipat was not kind." Marie looked at her Nutcracker doll. "I will 
I'll look after you, she told it. That night, Marie had a dream. The Mouse King came into her room. He fought the Nutcracker. The Nutcracker killed the Mouse King. Come with me, Marie, the Nutcracker said. We are going to Toyland. I am the new king. In the morning, Marie woke up. She thought about Toyland. She said, I will always love my Nutcracker. I don't care if he is ugly. She looked for the Nutcracker, but it was gone. Mr. Drosselmeyer came again. He was with a boy. This is my nephew, he said. The boy was the Nutcracker doll. He had changed back. You saved me, Marie, said the boy. We will get married. You will be the queen of Toyland. Marie was very happy. The Sandman. Chapter One Nathaniel. One day, a terrible thing happened to Nathaniel. A weather glass seller came to his room. Nathaniel bought nothing. He did not like the man. Nathaniel said he was going to kick the man down the stairs. The man went away. This may seem a very strange thing for Nathaniel to do, but Nathaniel's actions came from what happened during his childhood. When he was a child, Nathaniel did not see his father much. He only saw his father at dinner. After dinner, his father told fun stories to him and his mother. But some nights were different. His father did not tell stories. He gave his son picture books to look at. On these nights, his mother was sad, and his father did not talk. When it was nine o'clock, his mother would say, Off to bed! The Sandman is coming! Nathaniel always heard a strange sound when she said this. It sounded like slow, heavy steps. He asked his mother, Who is this mean Sandman? She would laugh and say, Oh, there is no Sandman. I only mean that you are sleepy and can't keep your eyes open. It is like someone put sand in them. Nathaniel did not believe this answer. One day, he asked an old woman he knew. She told him, He is a bad man. He goes to little children who won't go to bed. The Sandman throws sand in their eyes. Some children jump out of bed. Then he puts them in a bag. He takes them to the moon to feed them to his little ones. The Sandman's children have beaks like owls. They pick out the eyes of bad boys and girls. Nathaniel did not really believe her, but he was still afraid. He thought about the old woman's story when his mother would send him to bed at nine o'clock. His mother would say, The Sandman is coming! On these nights, Nathaniel heard the slow, heavy steps and smelled a strange smell.
Chapter 2 The Sandman One night, Nathaniel's father did not tell stories, and his mother was sad. Nathaniel told them that he was tired and left the room before nine o'clock. He went into his father's room and hid behind a curtain. Soon, Nathaniel heard footsteps. His father and another man came into the room. Nathaniel held his fear down and looked out. In the middle of his father's room stood the Sandman. The Sandman was not a monster. It was a man he knew. His name was Coppelius. He had a large head, a big nose, and a mean smile. Nathaniel's mother did not like him, but his father treated Coppelius like a friend. Coppelius told his father in his mean voice, To work! They opened up a closet door, but it was not a closet. It was a hearth with a blue flame. The shadows made the men look like they had no eyes. Coppelius cried, Eyes here! Eyes here! Nathaniel screamed and fell to the floor. Coppelius grabbed him and threw him on the hearth. Now we've got eyes! He was about to throw Nathaniel into the blue fire. His father said, Master, let my Nathaniel keep his eyes. Coppelius laughed and said, <laughs> Well then, let's see how the hands and feet work. He turned Nathaniel's hands and feet this way and that. Everything grew dark. Nathaniel woke up in bed later. His mother was standing over him. Is the Sandman still here? Nathaniel asked. No, my dear child, he's long gone. He will not hurt you, she said. Coppelius did not come again for a long time. Chapter 3 A Sad Day About a year later, Nathaniel's father was telling them funny stories after dinner. At nine o'clock, they heard the side door open and the slow, heavy footsteps. That is Coppelius, his mother said, looking afraid. Yes, it is, said his father. This is the last time he will come. Take our son and go upstairs. She told Nathaniel to go to sleep, but he was too afraid. Around midnight, there was a loud noise. The whole house moved. Nathaniel jumped out of bed. Then he heard a terrible scream. He ran to his father's room. The door stood open and clouds of smoke came out of the door. On the floor by the smoking hearth, Nathaniel saw his father. He was dead. His face was burned black. Coppelius! Nathaniel cried. Coppelius killed my father! Coppelius was not seen after that, and no one knew where he had gone. For years, Nathaniel did not know what happened to Coppelius. However, when the weather glass seller visited him, he knew that it was the terrible man Coppelius. The man was dressed differently, but Nathaniel remembered his face very well. He did not even change his name much. He was now an Italian who called himself Giuseppe Coppola. 
Nathaniel thought, This is the man who killed my father. Then he said to the weather glass seller, Get out of here! Go before I kick you down the stairs! After the weather glass seller left, Nathaniel wrote a letter to Clara. She was a girl he loved. He told her about what had happened when he was a child. He also told her how Coppola came to his door. Clara wrote back to Nathaniel. She told him that it was only in his head. She wrote, I think that old Coppelius did not like children, but I don't think he killed your father. Your father caused his own death. He was doing strange experiments. Try to be happy. Forget about this Coppelius and Giuseppe Coppola. Nathaniel was angry with her for not believing him. Chapter 4 The Professor A few days later, Nathaniel found out some big news. A professor from his school had known Coppola for many years. The professor was an Italian man named Spallanzani. Spallanzani said Coppola was really Italian. But how could that be? The evil Coppelius was German. Nathaniel wanted to believe Spallanzani, but he was not sure. Professor Spallanzani was a strange person. One time, as Nathaniel went by his house, he looked into the window. In the room was a tall and very thin female. She was sitting with her arms on a little table. She had a beautiful face but there was something strange about her eyes. Later, Nathaniel learned that he had seen Spallanzani's daughter, Olympia. Spallanzani kept her in a locked room. No man could go near her. Both the father and daughter were strange. Nathaniel did not have time to think much about Spallanzani or his daughter. Nathaniel was going home in a few days and would see his mother. He would also see Clara and her brother, Lothair. Thinking about this made Nathaniel happy. Chapter 5 The Duel Nathaniel visited his mother's house. Lothair and Clara did not have parents so his mother let them live in her house. Clara and Nathaniel were going to get married. She was not beautiful, but she had beautiful hair and smiled sweetly. She was nice and calm. She also had a good heart. When Clara flew into Nathaniel's arms, he forgot that he was angry with her for her letter. She was happy to be home. In a few days, however, Nathaniel changed. He acted strangely and was always gloomy. Then he became angry when Clara showed that she did not like how he was acting. Nathaniel decided to write a poem. It would explain how Coppelius had ruined his happiness when he was a child. He wanted Clara to hear the poem so she could understand him. The next day, Nathaniel and Clara sat in the garden. He decided that now was the time to read Clara his poem. He took it out and read it to her. When he finished, Clara said, Nathaniel, throw that thing away! Nathaniel jumped to his feet. He was very angry. You lifeless robot! Then he ran away because she did not understand him. 
Clara told Lefer what had happened. He went to Nathaniel. Lefer told him, You made Clara cry. Tell her you are sorry or fight with me. The two men decided that they would fight with swords in the morning. Early the next day, the two men met to fight. Clara ran into the garden crying. She shouted, You terrible men! How can I live with my brother killing my love or my love killing my brother? Both of the men were very sorry. They threw their swords to their feet. All three held each other and said they loved each other. Not long after that, Nathaniel returned to school. He had one more year to finish. Chapter 6 The Spyglass When Nathaniel went back to school, he had a surprise. His room had burned to the ground. However, his friends saved his things. Nathaniel moved to a new room. Now he lived across the street from Professor Spallanzani. He could see into the window where Olympia sat alone. She remained there for long hours without doing anything. One day, Nathaniel heard a knock on his door. When he said, Come in, Coppola's ugly face came inside. Nathaniel felt cold with fear. Then he tried to calm himself. He told himself that Professor Spallanzani knew the man. He had also promised Clara that he would forget his childish fear of Coppelius. Chapter 7 The Ball For days, Nathaniel only left his window to go to class. When he was home, he sat hour after hour at the window. He was watching Olympia through the spyglass. Then one day, Nathaniel returned home and found that many people were coming and going at Spallanzani's home. Nathaniel learned that Spallanzani was going to give a concert and a ball on the following day. He was also going to let Olympia meet people. Nathaniel got an invitation too. The next night, Nathaniel visited Spallanzani's house and saw that Olympia was beautifully dressed. She played the piano very well and sang beautifully. 
Her voice was almost too perfect. The only strange thing was that she walked stiffly. Nathaniel was happy when the concert ended. He wanted to dance with Olympia. He held her hand and waist while they danced. She took perfect steps, which made him think that his dancing was bad. He did not dance with anyone else except Olympia. All evening, Nathaniel looked into Olympia's eyes and held her cold hands. Nathaniel told her, You beautiful lady, you are the one I love. Olympia sat with her eyes fixed on him and said, Ah, ah. Finally, the lights went out. The ball was over. As Nathaniel left, he asked her, Do you love me? Then he kissed her cold lips. Olympia only said, Ah, ah, as she rose to her feet. Professor Spallanzani said, Come again, my boy. You may come and talk to my daughter any time. Nathaniel left the ball very happy. Chapter 8 Olympia Professor Spallanzani seemed happy to have Nathaniel visit with Olympia. During the next few days, everyone talked about the ball. Nathaniel's friends thought that Olympia was strange and boring. They said, All she ever says is, Ah, ah. Nathaniel's good friend, Sigmund, thought Olympia was strange too. He asked Nathaniel, How could you lose your head over that wooden doll? Nathaniel said, Don't you see how wonderful Olympia is? But it is for the best. We would fight about her if you thought she was wonderful too. Sigmund saw that his friend was in love. Nathaniel did not see that her eyes had no life. He did not see that she walked and danced like machine, not a living person. Olympia only sat and listened. Nathaniel thought, only she understands me. He looked for the ring his mother gave him. He wanted to give it to Olympia to show his love to her. When he found the ring, Nathaniel ran across the street to Olympia. While on the stairs, he heard pushing and knocking on the door. Then he heard voices. Leave, you monster! I made the eyes and the inside of the machine. Stop! You watchmaker, let me go! The voices were Spallanzani and Coppola. Nathaniel ran in. The professor held a female figure by the shoulders. Coppola held her by the feet. They were both pulling her as they fought over her. Nathaniel saw that the figure was Olympia. He tried to help her. Coppola pulled her away suddenly and threw her over his shoulder. Then he turned and laughed before running away. Nathaniel then saw that Olympia's white face had no eyes. Spallanzani had fallen to the floor. There were small pieces of glass all around him. He shouted, After him! He has taken my best robot! Chapter 9 The Wooden Doll When Nathaniel heard that his love was a robot, he grabbed the professor by the throat. He would have killed him if his friends had not come. They held his arms. Nathaniel began to scream. Spin round, wooden doll! He tried to push and hit everyone around him. His friends threw him to the floor to hold him. Someone said, Call a doctor! Nathaniel needs to be taken away!
when he finally opened his eyes, Nathaniel felt as if he had woken up from a terrible dream. Clara was next to him. She said, At last, your terrible illness is over. You are mine again. His mother and Lothair were with him as well. All three of them took care of Nathaniel. In this way, Nathaniel rested and got better. He and Clara decided to get married. Nathaniel told his mother, She is my love who has made my life right again. Nathaniel and Clara went to visit the town near the house. There, they decided to go up the tall tower. Nathaniel wanted to look at the town and hills. Go up, Lothair said. I will wait here for you. Chapter 10 The Tower As they were looking around, Clara said, Look at that strange little gray bush. It looks like it's walking toward us. Nathaniel put his hand in his pocket and pulled out the spyglass that Coppola had sold him. Looking through it, he suddenly went white. He began screaming. Spin round, wooden doll! He looked at Clara with strange eyes. He grabbed her and tried to throw her from the tower. Clara screamed. Help me! Save me! Lothair was at the bottom of the stairs. He ran up as quickly as he could. The door was locked. Lothair kicked it as hard as he could to open it. Lothair hit Nathaniel. Then he grabbed his sister and took her down the stairs. She was saved. Nathaniel ran around and around the top of the building. He screamed and screamed. Spin round! Spin round! People heard shouting from the top of the building. A crowd began to form. One man, Coppelius, stood out from the crowd. He stood at the bottom of the tower, looking up. Some people wanted to bring Nathaniel down, but Coppelius said, Wait, he'll come down on his own. All at once, Nathaniel stopped. He looked down at Coppelius. Then Nathaniel suddenly jumped from the building, screaming, Fine eyes! Fine eyes! The people ran to the body on the ground. They found that Nathaniel was dead. Coppelius walked calmly away from the crowd of people. He was never seen again. Puss in Boots A farmer with three sons died. His first son got the farm. His second son got the horse. His third son got the cat. The cat's name was Puss. Puss said, Don't worry, master. Give me a bag. Give me some boots. I will take care of you. The boy gave Puss a bag and boots. Puss went into a field. He put some grass in the bag. A rabbit saw the grass. It went into the bag. Puss caught the rabbit. Puss took the rabbit to the king. Puss said, 
This is a present. It is from the Count of Carabas. The next day, Puss caught a bird. He took it to the king. Puss said, "This is a present. It is from the Count of Carabas." Puss did this for two months. Every day, he gave a gift to the king. One day, the king was talking to his daughter. The king said, "Let's go for a ride." Puss heard him. He ran home. Puss told the boy, "Go swimming. Swim in the river near the road." The boy took off his clothes. He swam in the river. Puss hid the boy's clothes. The king and the princess came. Puss yelled, "Help! The Count of Carabas is in trouble. Thieves took my master's clothes." The king heard Puss. He saw the boy in the river. The king told his daughter, "Look." That is the Count of Carabas. The king gave the boy some clothes. He asked the boy to ride with them. Puss ran ahead of them. Some men were working in a field. Puss said, "Excuse me, do you work for the monster in the castle on the hill?" "Yes." The men said. Puss said, "The king is coming. You must tell him that this is the Count of Carabas's field. If you don't, the monster will eat you." <laughs> the king came to the field. He saw the men working. The king asked. Whose field is this? The men said, "This is the Count of Carabas's field." The boy was not listening. He was talking with a princess. They were falling in love. <coughs> Puss ran ahead. He ran to the castle on the hill. Inside, Puss found the monster who lived there. Puss said, "Excuse me." The monster said, "What? A cat?" Puss said, "I heard you can change into things." The monster said, "Yes, I can." He changed into a lion. The lion jumped at Puss, but Puss jumped onto a high shelf. Puss said, "Wow, you can change into a lion, but that looks easy." Easy? The monster roared. Puss asked, "Can you change into something small?" The monster said, "Of course I can." Puss asked, "Can you change into a mouse?" The monster laughed. He said, "Watch this!" The monster changed into a mouse. Puss jumped down from the shelf. He ate the mouse. The king arrived at the castle. Puss said to the boy, "Welcome home, master." The puss said to the king, "Welcome, sir. Welcome to the castle of the Count of Carabas." The king said, "My dear count, 
You should marry my daughter. And they were all happy after that. Heidi. Heidi was a little orphan with pink cheeks and curly brown hair. Her parents died when she was a baby. Her aunt Data looked after her. When Heidi was five, Aunt Data left her with her grandfather. You will live here now, Aunt Data said. Heidi's grandfather lived on a mountain slope. He was a good carpenter. He lived in a small house that he built. He had two goats that gave him milk. The white goat was called Little Swan. The brown goat was called Little Bear. A boy called Peter looked after everyone's goats. He took them up the mountain every day to find good grass to eat. Peter was eleven. He lived with his mother and grandmother in a small house on the same mountain as Heidi's grandfather. Every day, Peter came for the goats. Then he took them up to the good mountain grass. Heidi often went with him. They played and talked together. They were good friends. Heidi loved living with her grandfather. She slept on a soft bed made of hay. She and her grandfather ate goat cheese with bread. She drank warm goat's milk. Heidi didn't have to go to school. She just played with Peter and the goats. She looked at pretty flowers and saw birds flying in the sky. Sometimes she went to visit Peter's grandmother, who was blind. They talked and laughed together. Everyone loved Heidi. But after three years, Aunt Dita came to take Heidi away. You must live in the city, she told Heidi. You must play with a sick girl called Clara. She can't walk and needs a friend. Heidi was very sad to leave. Aunt Data told her, "Hurry, Heidi, pack your things. We must go." Clara lived in a big mansion in the city. She was twelve years old. She was often tired because she was sick. She sat in a wheelchair because she could not walk. Clara's mother died when she was little. Her father was often away for his work. Miss Rottenmeier, a strict woman, looked after her. Heidi was scared of Miss Rottenmeier. But she liked Clara. Clara was very kind to her. But Heidi often felt lonely. She missed the mountains and her grandfather. She missed Peter and his grandmother. She missed the goats and the mountain flowers. The two girls had lessons together. A man came to the house to teach them to read and write. Heidi tried to learn, but it was too difficult. One day, Clara's grandmother came to visit. She gave Heidi a big storybook full of colorful pictures. You must learn to read, she told Heidi. Then you can read the stories in this book. I will let you keep it. After that, Heidi learned to read.
months went by, and Heidi started to get very sick because she missed her home. Her cheeks were pale. Her hair wasn't shiny. She couldn't sleep or eat. Sometimes Heidi walked through the big house at night while she was dreaming. The people in the house thought Heidi was a ghost. Clara's father called the doctor to help Heidi. She must go home to the mountains, the doctor said. Heidi was told to pack her things. She would go back to live with her grandfather. Clara gave Heidi many gifts. She gave her a new coat and hat. She also gave her gifts for Peter's grandmother. The gifts were some soft white bread rolls and a shawl. Now Peter's grandmother won't have to eat hard black bread, Heidi said. The shawl will keep her warm on cold days. I will miss you, said Clara. Come and visit me, said Heidi. You will love the mountains. I'll come soon, said Clara. I want to meet your friends. Heidi was very happy to be home. She helped her grandfather in the house. She played with little swan and little bear. Heidi visited Peter's blind grandmother again. She gave her the soft white bread rolls to eat. Heidi also read stories to her. Over time, Heidi even taught Peter to read. After that, they went to school together. One day, Clara's doctor came to visit. He told Heidi that Clara was not well. She will come next spring, the doctor said. The doctor enjoyed visiting Heidi and her grandfather. He had no family. His daughter had died the year before. Heidi was like his new daughter. Before he left, the doctor said, "I think I will come back to live here with you and your grandfather." In spring, Clara came to visit Heidi. She slept with Heidi in her bedroom. Every day, Heidi's grandfather gave Clara warm milk from Little Swan to drink. The milk made Clara healthy and strong. Soon, she had pink cheeks like Heidi. But Peter was not happy. Heidi didn't play with him when Clara was there. He was so angry that he pushed Clara's wheelchair down the mountain. Now Clara will have to go home, he thought. The wheelchair broke on the rocks. Peter did not want to break the chair. Oh no, he thought. What have I done? Then Peter ran away. Clara had no wheelchair. What will we do? Asked Heidi. I feel stronger. I will try to walk, said Clara. She took a step. Then she took another step. Clara could walk. Not long after that, Clara's father and grandmother came to visit. They were very happy to see her walk. Thank you, grandfather. Thank you, Heidi. Peter heard about Clara. He came back. He told everyone what he did. I'm very sorry, he said. You did something naughty, said Heidi's grandfather. But this time it all worked out. Clara learned to walk because you broke her chair. Everyone was happy. The Prince and the Pauper.
Chapter One: Two Boys. Five hundred years ago, two baby boys were born on the same day. They lived in the city of London. One was a rich prince. His name was Edward. He lived in the palace. The other boy was a pauper. His name was Tom. He lived in a small wooden house with his mother, father, grandmother, and two sisters. They all slept in one small room. The children did not have beds and had to sleep on the floor. Tom's father stole things from people. He liked to hit Tom. His mother was a beggar, and Tom helped her. It was a hard life. Tom had one grown-up friend, an old man. He taught Tom to read and write. He told Tom wonderful stories about kings, queens, and princes. These stories made Tom excited, and he started to dream that he was a prince. Tom told his poor friends his dream, but they laughed at him. He didn't care. Tom acted like a prince. He was very good at it. The other children thought he was smart. They acted like his servants, and it was a fun game. At night, the game stopped. Then Tom had to go home, and he was just a poor, hungry boy again. One day, Tom went looking for food. He walked far from home. He didn't know where he was. He saw many big buildings with big gates. The gates were gold. He saw a guard. Tom was in front of the palace. Many people were there to see the prince. Tom walked to the front of the crowd. His eyes grew big because he could see Prince Edward. The prince looked kind. He was dressed in beautiful clothes. He had many servants around him. Tom pushed his face through the gate. He wanted to get closer. One of the guards grabbed Tom. The guard shouted, "Get away from me, a beggar boy!" The crowd laughed at Tom. The prince heard the shouting and ran to the gates. He said, "Open the gates and let him in." The crowd stopped laughing. They shouted, "Long live Prince Edward!" Prince Edward looked at Tom. "I think you are tired and hungry, so come with me." Tom went into the palace with the prince. Chapter Three: A Big Mistake. The prince gave Tom some food to eat. He asked Tom many questions about his life. Tom told him about his family and the many games he played with his friends. We play at sword fighting a lot. In the summer, we swim in the river. Tom told the prince. We dance and sing too. The prince had a lonely life. He thought Tom's life sounded fun. Tom was very surprised. 
I would give anything to be dressed in your fine clothes, he said. I want to be like you. Then let's change clothes, said the prince. So they did. Tom and Edward looked in the mirror. Tom looked like the prince. Edward looked like the pauper. They were surprised. The two boys had the same hair, lips, nose, and eyes. We have the same face, said Edward. You're right, said Tom. We have the same voice, said Edward. We do, said Tom. The prince saw that Tom's hand was hurt. Who did that? He asked. The guard outside, said Tom. The prince was angry. He ran outside wearing Tom's dirty clothes. He shouted at the guard. The guard thought he was Tom and pushed him out of the gate. You made trouble for me, boy. Now get away. But I am Prince Edward, said Edward. Everyone laughed. <laughs> They did not believe him. You're making a big mistake, shouted Edward. No one listened. Chapter 4 Tom the Prince Inside the palace, everyone thought that Tom was the prince. King Henry thought so. The prince's sisters, Princesses Elizabeth and Mary, thought so. His cousin, Lady Jane, thought so. All the great lords and ladies thought so too. So did the servants. When Tom said something strange, they all said, Poor Prince Edward, he is mad! Tom was too scared to tell them who he was. He did his best to act like the prince. He made many mistakes. He didn't eat like a prince or know any of the prince's homework. He didn't know what to say when they asked him questions. I forgot the answers, he said. He hoped the real Prince Edward would come back soon. Chapter 5 Prince Edward's Adventures Edward was angry. No one believed that he was the prince. They were mean to him because they thought he was poor. Everywhere he went, he said, I am Prince Edward. <laughs> People would laugh. He did not look like a prince. He looked like a pauper. They all thought he was mad. The prince was tired, hungry, and scared. He felt lonely in the big city. He walked to the river and over a large bridge. A dirty man grabbed his shirt. Come here, Tom. You are a bad boy, the man said. I am Prince Edward, said the prince. The man laughed. <laughs> You are no prince. You are my son, Tom. The prince had to go with Tom's father. He had to sleep in the small room in the wooden house. The prince told the family, I am not Tom. I am Prince Edward. His mother and sisters cried. Poor Tom is mad, they said.
In the morning, the prince ran away. He met a kind man called Sir Miles. He told Sir Miles his story. Sir Miles also thought the boy was mad, but he felt sorry for him. I will play this game and wait. He will get better, he thought. Sir Miles took Edward home. I will look after you, my prince, he said. The prince was happy to have a servant. The next morning, Sir Miles went to buy Edward some clean clothes. The prince was sleeping. When Sir Miles came back, Edward was gone. Tom's father had taken him away. Chapter 6 The Real King Sir Miles looked everywhere for the prince. He found him in a small town outside London. The prince was in trouble. Tom's father and his bad friends stole a pig. The people of the town chased them, so they ran away. They left the pig with Prince Edward. Everyone thought he was the thief. The people took Prince Edward to jail. There, he met many poor people. One day, when I am king, I will help them, he thought. Sir Miles told the people that Edward was mad. The people let the prince go. Take this mad boy back to London, they said. Then everyone heard some sad news. King Henry is dead. Prince Edward is the new king, shouted a man from the palace. My father is dead, cried the prince. He was very sad. Tom is going to take my place. He will be the new king. We must go to London quickly to stop this. At the palace, Tom was feeling scared. I don't want to be king. I miss my family, he cried. The next day, there was a big party for the new king. All the lords and ladies of the land were there. Just as they were about to put the king's crown on Tom's head, they heard a shout. I am the real king, said the voice. It was Prince Edward. Yes, he is, agreed Tom. Please, Prince Edward, come and get your crown. I don't want to be king. Edward took the crown. Long live the king! shouted the crowd. Thank you for giving me back my crown, said Edward to Tom. I will look after poor people like you now that I am the king. You will not be a pauper anymore. Tom was happy. Sir Miles was surprised that Edward was the real king. He was happy too. King Edward was the happiest of all. Sleeping Beauty
There was a king and queen. They wanted a baby very much. They tried for many years to have one. Then they had a daughter. They named the princess Rose. They were very happy. They had a party. They invited seven fairies. The fairies could give the princess special gifts. But the king forgot something. He forgot to invite the eighth fairy. The eighth fairy was very old. She did not like to be with people or fairies. The king thought she was dead. But she was not dead. Now she was very angry. On the night of the party, the eighth fairy came to the castle. She wanted to hurt the baby princess. The youngest fairy saw her. She knew the old fairy was angry. The youngest fairy hid. She watched and waited. What was the old fairy going to do? The six other fairies gave Rose her gifts. They used their magic. One fairy gave her beauty. Another gave her a kind heart. A third gave her a gift of singing. All the gifts were wonderful. Then the old fairy jumped out. I have a gift too, said the old fairy. When Rose turns 16, she will die. She will hurt her finger on a spinning wheel. The queen fainted. The king cried, Oh no! Then the youngest fairy came out. She said, I will change the bad spell. I cannot change everything. But I can't save your daughter's life. How? said the king. Rose will not die, said the fairy. She will sleep for one hundred years. Then a prince must kiss her to wake her up. From that day on, no spinning wheels were allowed in the castle. Sixteen years went by. One day, the king and queen went to see their friends. Rose stayed in the castle. The old fairy came back. She brought a spinning wheel. Rose found the old fairy in a small room. What are you doing? asked Rose. I am spinning this cotton, said the old fairy. Can I try? asked Rose. Yes, said the old fairy. Rose sat down and began spinning. Then she hurt her finger. Rose fell asleep. The king and queen came back. They found Rose asleep. The young fairy came to help them. I will make another spell, said the fairy. I'll make everyone in the castle sleep for 100 years. Even the dogs and cats? asked the queen. Everyone, said the fairy. 
The fairy used her magic wand. She put the servants to sleep. She put the cooks to sleep. She put the cleaners to sleep. She put the horses to sleep. Everyone and everything in the castle went to sleep. The king and queen could not stay. Goodbye, Rose. Goodbye, Rose, they cried. Then the fairy used another spell. Big trees grew all around the castle. One hundred years passed. One day, a prince came to the castle. He was hunting in the forest. The prince found the castle behind the trees. He saw all the people asleep. Then the prince found Rose. She was very beautiful. He gave her a kiss. Rose woke up. Ah! Oh! So did all the servants and animals. The prince married Rose. They were very happy.